Okay. So this is the second half of our lecture about ancient Egypt and the kingdom of Kush. So you should have already watched the first half, which is about ancient Egypt. We're just going to jump through those slides really quick because I can't get it to start the slide where I want it to start the slides. <laughs> um, so you remember we talked about the different, uh, some of the different gods. We went through the pre-dynastic and early dynastic um, parts of Egypt and talked about a lot of these um, structures, including the pyramids, including the sphinx. We talked about the rigidity in um, statues and how that shifts a little bit over time and we see some more naturalistic kind of things. We talk about how we go from pyramids to the rock cut tombs and then we end up with these kind of um, temples like the one of Hatshepsut who was the very powerful female pharaoh that we talked about for a while. Uh, Ramses II, the warrior king. Um, and then we got uh, into the hypostyle kind of halls, which is uh, the halls that were held up by these giant columns, right? Um, we looked at some examples of painting, and then we ended up with the um, with Akhenaton and uh, the Amarna period, and talking about Akhenaton, his wife Nefertiti, his mother uh, Tai, who were important figures in all of the vast cultural changes that they brought about, including the change in uh, religion, right? Okay, so today I want to talk about the kingdom of Kush. And this is my first uh, version of this lecture. So this is the first time I've done this particular lecture. So you're, you're sort of uh, a little bit my guinea pigs uh, if you're watching this in fall um, 2021. Um, I, I generally change lectures and re-record them over time. Um, so I'm excited about this and I uh, hope you are too. So let's talk about the Kingdom of Kush. So we've been talking about Egypt. And one of the things that I always thought was very odd when I was an undergraduate art history student was that when we talked about Egypt, we talked about it in this way that kind of isolated it from the rest of Africa. And the context that I remember learning about Egypt in art history classes was in the context of the Mediterranean, Mediterranean in the context of Europe, particularly in relation to um, the Roman Empire in the much later, in the much later part of the Egyptian uh, rule. And I, at the time, I thought it was odd, right? Because it's it seemed like... Egypt was sort of looked at this separate thing that was almost more connected to Europe than it was to the rest of Africa. And then we didn't talk about any other African art at all or any other African civilizations at all in my survey art history classes when um, I was an undergrad. And I thought that was kind of weird. And now that I am teaching art history one, I don't want to do that. So um, what I would like to talk to you about today is uh, the Kingdom of Kush. And so, <coughs> excuse me, this is the land uh, to the south of Egypt, and it was known in the ancient world by many different names. So it was known as Ta-Seti, T-A-S-E-T-I, which means the land of the bow, because uh, the people who lived here were expert archers. Um, it was known as Ta-Nehisi, T-A-N-E-N-E. H-E-S-I, which is the land of copper, because they had lots of uh, resources and riches like copper. Nubia, which is um, derived from the Egyptian word for gold, because this was also a kingdom that was very rich in gold. And Kush. And the kingdom of Kush is how it was most prominently referred to. Um, so you may, if you read about it, sometimes it's all it's also called by these other names like Nubia, like Tessetti, but uh, mostly it's called the Kingdom of Kush. And this kingdom uh, dominated what is now the Sudan between 2500 BC and 300 AD. Um, some religious scholars link it to Kush, which is C-U-S-H, and Kush was the son of Ham, um, who was the son of Noah. So Cush was the grandson of Noah that is said to have gone to Africa and populated Africa um, in, in the Judeo-Christian tradition of the Bible. So some people think that the name Cush is, is related there. Um, and this is an area in its history where 
it's just been largely ignored by Western scholars and archaeologists until the mid 20th century. And I do want to give a little shout out to um, an archaeologist, a Swiss archaeologist whose name um, is Charles Bonnet. And he really pushed this research forward and really had to fight with a lot of the um, kind of racist institutions that looked at uh, early African civilizations in um, an unfavorable light and sort of diminished the accomplishments and the, the, the achievements of these civilizations. And he has discovered a lot of information about this ancient civilization, the Kingdom of Kush, and has really pushed that research and really kind of changed the, the lens through which it's viewed in Western scholarship, which is good and important. Um, okay. So, um, that's Charles Bonnet. He's now 87 years old. He still goes to Kerma every year and has been going since 1970 to do research and to fight for its acceptance into the canon of Western scholarship. So good job, dude. Uh, okay. So the first major discovery was of Kerma. So let's look at a map. So Egypt is up here. This is the Nile. The Nile goes down through Sudan as well. And you can see on the map of Africa there where we're related, we're situated directly south of Egypt in what is now the Sudan. Um, and so the first discovery was of Kerma. And um, it was dated as early as 3000 BC and was the first capital of the powerful indigenous kingdom that um, expanded to encompass the land in southern Egypt and in the contemporary Sudan. So the kingdom of Kush expands over that line into Egypt at one point. Um, and this kingdom rivaled and at times overtook Egypt. It was as advanced as Egypt and they had um, a really complicated history. They traded with each other. They also fought with each other. Egypt conquered them. They conquered Egypt. There was a lot of, it's, there, it's a very integrated history. So it's even kind of stranger to talk about Egypt sort of completely isolated from Africa, but particularly from this um, other ancient kingdom. Um, so the first Kushite kingdom was very involved in trade. They traded gold, they traded ivory, bronze, copper, all of these things with Egypt and with uh, Punt, P-U-N-T, which was a civilization along the Red Sea to the east. Um, and Kush became famous for its blue glazed pottery. You can see an example of that here. And also for its red brown um, tulip shaped ceramics, which you can see an example on the left here as well. Um, they were also very advanced in this technique called uh, faience, which is F-A-I-E-N-C-E, -E, that Egypt is also well known for. And it's a glazing technique um, where you take earthenware ceramics that you fire and then you glaze them using uh, tin. So you melt tin into the glazing liquid to create a kind of lustrous exterior. And this was used on vessels like the blue glazed vessel in the middle and also on um, jewelry and beading like this is a beaded belt from Kush um, on the right that is that is glazed in this technique. Around 1500 BC Egypt's pharaohs march south along the Nile um, and they conquer Kerma so they take over what was then the capital of Kush called Kerma K E R M A, and they establish, they build temples and they build forts there. Um, so they bring the Egyptian culture and religion into Nubia, into the kingdom of Kush. Egyptians believed that the source of all creation was in Nubia. Uh, specifically, they believed it was on this flat mountain top by this S-shaped bend in the Nile, and they build a holy temple at the site called Jebel Berkal. So if we look back on our uh, map, you can see Jebel Berkal up there by that big bend in the Nile. So that was an important, that became a really important part of um, Egypt's mythology and religion. This was the creation site where people came from, where the gods came down and made people, basically. Um, and I mentioned earlier that the Kushites uh, were well known um, for their archers. They made very successful um, air weapons, arrows, and bows and arrows. So here's some examples of flint arrowheads. Um, and then here's just some more examples of the kinds of goods that they created and were trading. So they worked with precious metals a lot, 
gold, bronze, copper, and silver. And you can see the level of detail and the fine kind of jeweled detailing here. Um, the second image is a section of beading that were these fans, uh, glazed beads that were used to um, adorn the king's horse. So it was, everything was very ornate and very beautifully appointed. Um, okay. So we have um, Egyptian rule prevails in Kush until the 11th century BC. And that's when Egypt begins to really um, weaken. Um, and a new dynasty of Kushite kings rises up in the city of Napata. Um, so one of the things I want to look at before we talk about this kind of rising up and, and what happens after that is just look at the influence of Egypt in Kush. So this is the Temple of Solab, which is in what is now the Sudan. And if you look at it, we didn't talk about the Temple of Luxor yet, which um, is on the bank of the Nile in Egypt. But this is around 1400 BC. And if you look at the style of this temple, and then we look at the kind of overhead shots of the plans of the Temple of Luxor and the Temple of Solab, they're very similarly designed. They both have that kind of hypostyle hall that we talked about, that we were seeing um, become kind of a favorite architectural style in Egypt. And so this temple was built when Egypt came down and took over part of the kingdom of Kush. And this influence stays in Kush, and this becomes um, kind of uh, one of the styles of architecture that we see for a long time. A lot of art historians and archaeologists actually think these two temples may have been designed by the same architect. They are so similar. So you can see a, a lasting influence there. And then I just want to look at some um, closer up examples of that architecture within the Temple of Solab, because you can see that there are adornments here who are, that are um, hieroglyphics. We can see the symbol of the Ankh up above, the symbol of life, which we talked about um, when we were in the Egypt lecture. You can see the shape of the bundled columns, which is something that we saw um, in uh, one of Ramses' temples. So you can just see a relationship there. Um, another influence is we have a lot of the same kind of uh, sculptural motifs as well. So we have sphinxes we know in Egypt. We also have a lot of portrayal of lions, just lions um, in general. So um, this particular red granite lion statue is one of a pair um, that was at the Temple of Solab in uh, Nubia, it's dated 1340 BC, and it's inscribed so that we know that it was meant to be a representation of the pharaoh Amenhotep III. Um, but you can see it's adorned with writing with uh, hieroglyphics around the base, and so these are the kind of artifacts that are being found in Nubia from the time that uh, Egypt comes in. This lion also has a separate later inscription on its chest that is of a later Nubian king. So it's it's kind of like they reclaim these kind of Egyptian influences as their own. Here's a little, this is later, but this is, you can see that the Sphinx and lion motif carry through in the kingdom of Kush and they sort of take on some of these Egyptian motifs as their own. This is the Sphinx of uh, Taharko. Taharko was a um, pharaoh of Kush. He's from Kush and was the leader, not just of Kush, but also of Egypt when um, Egypt, Kush kind of takes over the dynasty system in Egypt later. So we'll talk about that a little bit more, but I just want to show this influence and how this is kind of a lasting influence. So we can see the strong relationship between these two uh, entities. And so this is the temple that was constructed at that big S bend in the Nile, uh, Jebel Barkal. So this is where Egyptians thought that their, their creation happened, that the creation of of man and of the world happened from their gods was at this on this flat um, mountainous area at that bend in the river. So here we have um, the ruins, the remnants of this temple, and then on the right there's a reconstruction of it, which you can see that looks kind of similar to some of the other Egyptian temples and Egyptian works that we've seen. Okay, so um, Egypt begins to weaken um, as a new dynasty of Kushite kings rises in the city of Napata. So Napata becomes the new capital after Kerma has been taken over. And this new capital asserted itself as the rightful inheritor and protector of the ancient Egyptian religion. So as you may remember when we were talking about Akhenaten and uh, the Amarna period, 
how they just worship um, a sun god and kind of united everything under this idea of this one god. So the older religion um, of Egypt with the multiple gods um, kind of still remains strong in Nubia and the kingdom of Kush. And they sort of take this culture, they don't really think of it as a Egypt's religion and culture that becomes they, they take it as their own and are, are very protective of that and as we just look through everything we can see that influence right so uh, the new capital asserts itself as the rightful inheritor and protector of the ancient Egyptian religion um, and then we have uh, Pi P-I-Y-E is Napata's third king and he decides to march north and he conquers Egypt in 730 BC. So he doesn't just push Egypt out of the kingdom of Kush, he continues up the Nile and conquers them. Um, so he expands the Kushite territory to include the entire Nile Valley, so all the way up through uh, upper and lower Egypt, all the way to the Mediterranean. Uh, Pai, who is also called uh, Pianchi, P-I-A-N-K-H-I, um, that's what he's more commonly known in Sudan. Um, so he starts a new dynasty of Egyptian pharaohs, and they are uh, colloquially known as the Black Pharaohs. And so the Kushite pharaohs of Egypt make up the 25th dynasty, and they rule for three quarters of a century until the Assyrians capture Egypt. Um, so they, they take over Egypt and rule for a long time. After their defeat, the Kushites return back to Napata, um, and then at the beginning of the 6th century BC, um, Satet the first, uh, Samtek the first, P-S-A-M-T-E-K, uh, the second, not the first, sorry, um, is Egypt's new pharaoh. And he comes down and attacks Napata. Basically, it's like a revenge, like, how dare you come and conquer and take over all of Egypt and the Nile Valley for a century. I'm going to come conquer you back. So the Kushites then relocate their capital again. So it was originally Kerma, then it was Napata, and then they relocate their capital to uh, Miroe. So Miroe becomes their new center, and it's a very important cultural location for the Kushites for the remainder of their reign. So let's look at Miroe. And uh, it is something that is fascinating to me. The first time I saw images of this, I was kind of blown away because what do we see here? Pyramids, right? Lots of pyramids, like 200 pyramids, lots and lots of pyramids, a different style than the Egyptian pyramids and that they're much steeper and they're smaller in scale, but definite uh, pyramids. It's in a really interesting location. So it's strategically located where inland African trade routes um, met up with caravan trades, uh, trails for trading from the Red Sea. The land's very fertile. Um, and it's also isolated enough to allow the Kushites to remain independent. Okay, so let's go back to our map really quick and just take a peek at where this is in relation to everything. Um, so Miroe is there, so you can see it's a little further south. Okay, but still on the Nile. The Nile is very important to, um, is as important to the Kingdom of Kush as it is to the Egyptians. It's very central to their societies. So let's take a peek at these. Um, so let's just look at these. So we have these kind of structures. The reason the tops are broken off of a bunch of these is not because they were worn down by weather. That destruction was done by an Italian explorer in the 19th century who was convinced that all of these um, pyramids were filled with gold. And so he literally went around just breaking, I'm not even gonna say his name, <laughs> so irritating to me as, as someone who loves art history. So he went around just breaking and destroying these um, structures because he was sure that if he broke enough of them, he'd find some that were full of gold and that was not the case and he's an idiot. So um, they were badly damaged and some of them have been restored as you can see. Um, you can also see carved into the brickwork there were... Um, these rich relief carvings of people and hieroglyphics that were narrative and were at one point brightly painted. But you can just kind of see how that looked on the horizon. It's kind of amazing. Um, so just to kind of catch up our history here, when uh, the Kushites remain independent, 
Um, when Cleopatra dies in 30 CE, Rome takes control of Egypt. So we didn't really talk about Cleopatra. Um, one of you is going to talk about her in the discussion post a little bit. Um, but basically, um, when she dies, and she dies by suicide, she kills herself with a snake, with a poisonous snake, um, Rome takes control of Egypt. So they expand the Roman Empire to cover Egypt. And this action really strains the truce between the Kushites, between the Kingdom of Kush and Rome. Um, under the leadership of Queen Amanarinas, uh, A-M-A-N-I-R-E-N-A-S, the uh, Kushite, or Meroite, as they're, they're called at this period, uh, forces attack Roman forces. So they fight back because Rome is trying to take over the entire world. <laughs> so they're coming south and wanted to take over Kush as well. And they fight back. And they're um, so um, fierce and, and still, you know, have great archers and are known as these fearsome uh, warriors that eventually the queen is able to negotiate a peace treaty with the Roman Empire that favored uh, Meroite interests over Rome. So she's able to kind of get... A deal for them that basically means Rome is going to leave them alone and let them continue to live uh, independently. Meroe enjoys relative peace and stability after this until it's abandoned in the fourth century. So in the fourth century it's sort of abandoned as a site. Um, that's the fourth century CE. Um, but we have all these wonderful resources, all these wonderful structures and things left behind by this incredible culture and kingdom. So let's look at a few more things. So this is another motif that you see in Egyptian art as well, and that is of these um, rams. So these are uh, sort of set up and, and look a little like the rows of lions and rows of sphinxes that we've seen in some of the structures in Egypt, but these are these very stylized rams, so sheep with big horns, right? And so we have rows of those uh, at the Amun temple. So this is uh, the Amun Re god, the sun god, the creator god that we see worshipped in Egyptian culture is also worshipped by the Kushites. And this is uh, a temple to him. And then we also have um, these kind of chapels that kind of um, call all the way back to the uh, stepped pyramid of Dozier and that complex. Remember, I showed you the first standalone uh, columns that we ever see in, in architectural design were at Dozier, designed by Imhotep. This is a very similar kind of design where we have these bundled columns with this kind of floral capitals on top. And this is a temple to uh, Hathor. Hathor is our, our mother goddess in Egyptian culture, which again, the Kushites take over this religion and are interested in that as well. And it's in pretty good condition. It's still standing. Um, we also have some, so it's not just these small steep pyramids. There's also a very um, large pyramid. The largest pyramid is at Al Kuru, which is um, also further south in what is now the Sudan. And it was built in 325 BC. It was once 115 feet high. So it was a very large, very formidable pyramid structure um, and it would still be there except that it was disassembled in the Middle Ages. So it's sad that a lot of these artifacts um, and monuments and structures have not fared very well in the Sudan and part of it is just because of um, they they just weren't people just didn't take care of, they just weren't regarded as um, as important by these um, Western explorers and people that came that were basically treasure hunters and just kind of destroyed things. So it's really frustrating. Uh, but um, we do have some remains of these materials so that we can see what once existed and what was there. Um, so that is my very brief first lecture on the Kingdom of Kush. I'm going to work on developing this further. Um, but I am excited to share this information with you. I actually, so I always listen to this, um, podcast called Mysteries Abound, and it's a podcast put on by an Australian guy named Paul Rex, and it's kind of, it's actually what I listen to to try and go to sleep at night, and it's really strange, because the one I listened to last night that he just put out, um, I think it was episode 259, I'm not sure, I'll look and, and let you know, but one of the 
things he's talking about in this, and he just reads articles about interesting things. It's very soothing. I recommend it. Um, and he was talking about the Kingdom of Kush, which was super fascinating to me because I hadn't heard that much about it ever. And then on this podcast I listen to all the time, surprise, here is Paul Rex talking about the Kingdom of Kush the night before I'm going to record this lecture. So that's a great podcast. He talks about lots of interesting, weird things. Um, and on the most recent episode, as of September 6th, uh, 2021, he talks about the Kingdom of Kush in, in that episode. So that's kind of a fun thing if you like podcasts and want to check that out. All right, um, next we're going to go up to the Aegean. So we're going to go back up toward uh, into Europe in Greece and we're going to talk about the uh, ancient Aegean and talk about where a lot of the myths and legends that form um, the religion of ancient Greece come from. So that'll be exciting. I look forward to talking to you more.